What Happened to Race by Oscar Handlin. Science, which created race as an intellectual concept, also helped destroy it. For it is the strength of science to contain within itself the means of its own redemption. The dedication to truth which animates the scholar's inquiry again and again brings him back to a reinvestigation of the evidence. Respect for the evidence raises in each man's mind questions as to the interpretations he builds upon it. The process of re-examination acquired more importance than ever before as scientists became aware of the degree to which their own preconceptions influenced their conclusions. The result was a complete revision of the basic ideas upon which the old notion of race rested. The scholarship of the past 30 years has touched at many points. When I say 30 years, this book was published in about 1950 or something like that. I don't know, 1960. When the fuck was this book published? This book was published in 1965, right? So it's dated. Anyway, the scholarship of the past 30 years has touched at many points upon the matters dealt with in the Dillingham and the Laughlin reports. It has coped far more adequately. What's the book? It's the American past. Anyway, we go on. Blah, 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 blah. The scholarship of the past 30 has touched at many points upon the matters dealt with in the Dillingham and the Laughlin reports. It has coped far more adequately with the patterns of prejudice and the problems of race with the course of immigration through American history, with the nature of the economic and social adjustment of the migrants, and with the extent to which intelligence, education, crime, insanity, blah, 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 and other social disorders vary among the diverse groups of the American population. Large areas, of course, still remain open for investigation. And at some place, I'll stop doing that soon. At some place, the evidence is inconclusive. But enough data is available to permit a fresh evaluation of the fundamental conceptions to which the Dillingham Commission gave expression 45 years ago. Such a reevaluation will show the distance science has traveled since. One, it's a bullet point, genetics and the race, or rather, and the nature of race. Intensive research, I like going into the bogus American accent, intensive research into the problems of heredity has led to a much clearer understanding of how physical traits are transmitted across the generations. In so doing, the theories both of Darwin and Galton have been abandoned. The new point of departure, or even departure, is that departure or departure? Departure has been the observations of an Austrian abbot who patiently tended the rows of peas in his garden. Johann Mendel, called Gregor when he became an Augustinian monk, published his conclusions in 1869. But the decades that followed were not congenial to his views, which lay disregarded for more than 30 years. Then, in 1900, their relevance became compellingly clear to a number of scholars, and modern genetics is the result. Such physical traits as the color of the eyes or hair and the pigmentation of the skin do pass through the genes from parents to children. Let me read that again. I've got to lose the accent because I'm fucking up. Such physical traits as the color of the eyes or hair and the pigmentation of the skin do pass through the genes from parents to children. The carriers have been identified and described. We now know, or we know now, that a group of individuals with common characteristics will procreate offspring with the same characteristics. Mankind is composed of a variety of populations which differ among themselves in the frequency of many genes. These Mendelian populations will reproduce themselves across time. But these Mendelian populations differ in two critical respects from what earlier geneticists called races. They are not identical with the national, linguistic, religious, economic, or other cultural groupings into which mankind is also divided. These overlap and cut across each other's boundaries. People with blue eyes, or with round, or with oblong heads, or with heads shaped like some prehistoric skull, or fat people or people convicted for crime or sufferers from cancer or other diseases do not form Mendelian populations. The attempt to conflate the various categories can only lead or even yield meaningless confusion. 
Furthermore, the Mendelian population is not fixed, but undergoes evolutionary changes. It may split into several distinct populations, or several quite separate ones may fuse into one. A variety of social and cultural or even cultural factors may break down or create gene pools. Therefore, the existence, this is good shit, therefore the existence of such a grouping at a given point in time is not in itself evidence of the common descent of its members any more than it establishes the presumption that their descendants will still be part of the same population. This is certainly a far cry from the conception of race as a fixed category, united by common descent and social as well as physical characteristics. Race, as a term, is still useful if properly defined. A helpful statement prepared for UNESCO by a group of distinguished biologists, psychologists, and social scientists in 1950 outlines the points upon which there was a general consensus of opinion. Its central conclusions may be stated as followed. Mankind is essentially one, hmm? descended from the same common stock. The species is divided into a number of populations or races, which differ, it's like Dr. Evil, isn't it? Um, populations of races which differ from each other in the frequency of one or more genes which determine the hereditary concentration of physical traits. These traits are not fixed, but may appear, fluctuate, and disappear in the course of time. It is presently possible to distinguish three such races, the Mongoloid, the Negroid, and the Caucasoid. Mm-hmm, see, I knew that was coming. But no subgroups within them can be meaningfully described in physical terms. National, religious, geographic, linguistic, and cultural groups do not coincide with race, and the cultural and social traits of such groups have no genetic connection with racial traits. There is no evidence of any inborn differences of temperament, personality, character, or intelligence among races. Therefore, it follows that the only meaningful basis upon which one can compare social and cultural traits is in terms of the ethnic group, which preserves its continuity to the extent that its culture passes from generation to generation through a common social environment. The inheritance of a, an ethnic group consists not of its biological characteristics, but of its culture, like the Celts or the Romans. You know, you could have been a Roman if you were living in, like, in, in uh, Algeria or a Roman living in... Uh, Germany, you know, or similarly uh, with the Celts. You could have been a Celt living in Wales or a Celt living in the fucking middle of Saxony. Anyway, he didn't have to actually have that down there. That's me adding. Anyway, where I am, time's running out, right? Um, that's my little addendum, a little injection there, right? The inheritance of an ethnic group consists not of its biological characteristics, but of its culture. Modern anthropology has therefore devoted more attention than was usual in earlier years to the study of cultural rather than physical differences, both in pre-literate and in our own societies. These differences are viewed as the product of habits, attitudes, beliefs, and institutions developed in the course of adjustments to their environment, or with the environment, broadly construed by individuals and cultural groups. Differences of this sort may persist over very long periods of time, but they are not determined by the physical traits of the men marked off by them. Since race, in the old sense, there's a big paragraph there, I should have paused, pause, right, paragraph. Since race, in the old sense, is no longer an important consideration, it will be enlightening to consider the effects of persisting cultural differences upon our society, primarily in terms of the place within it of the numerous ethnic groups of which it is formed. It may be in time that the Negroes will still constitute a distinct group, but one marked off by its own heritage rather than by the prejudice attached to its colour. Regarding the problem from that perspective, we have learned much in recent years about the effect on the nation of the heterogeneity and plurality of its population. Good shit.